Welcome to a very special Wednesday afternoon lecture, virtually, of course, because of COVID, uh, where we are going to hear from the distinguished researcher, uh, Lisa Cooper uh, from Johns Hopkins, who I will introduce in a moment. So this is the Dyer Lecture, just another bit of introduction here. Who, you might ask, was Rola E. Dyer, for whom this lecture was named and established on the year I was born, 1950, upon his retirement. So he was the NIH director from 1942 to 1950, a mere eight years. Uh, and he presided over NIH's transformation from what it was when he arrived, Institute Singular, to Institutes Plural of Health. Uh, he was also a well-known researcher in infectious disease, uh, particularly in the area of endemic typhus, and worked to create, guess what, a vaccine. So somehow uh, <laughs> it all fits together. This lecture was originally supposed to happen last March, and it was the very first Wednesday afternoon lecture uh, that fell uh, uh, to be a bit uh, of a consequence of COVID. So we're really glad to be able to put it back on tap here, albeit virtually. And we're very fortunate to have as the Rola Dyer lecturer, Dr. Lisa Cooper, who is currently the Bloomberg Distinguished Professor of Health and Healthcare Equity at Johns Hopkins and uh, both the School of Medicine and the Bloomberg School of Public Health. And she is director of the Johns Hopkins Center for Health Equity. Uh, born in Liberia, uh, she attended undergraduate at Emory, getting a BA in chemistry, and then went on to get an MD at a school that I'm also familiar with, the University of North Carolina. Following that, uh, an MPH at Johns Hopkins. Uh, her medical training, uh, she's an internist, uh, trained at the University of Maryland School of Medicine, and then at Hopkins, where she did a fellowship. And since 1994, she has been on the faculty of the Johns Hopkins School of Medicine uh, and where she is now the uh, Bloomberg Distinguished Professor. And she's also director of this center, the Johns Hopkins Center for Health Equity, which certainly is a topic of intense current importance as we are all focused on the realization that we have not achieved health equity or justice uh, in our country, despite our efforts over the past decades, we've still got a ways to go. She has been recognized in multiple ways, including uh, being uh, an awardee of the MacArthur Foundation, otherwise known as the Genius Award. She's a member elected to the National Academy of Medicine, as well as the American Association of Physicians. And I'm proud to say she has been a very important member of my advisory committee, the advisory committee to the director, uh, where she has provided sage advice over the course of the last few years uh, in a variety of different areas, but certainly in this area of diversity and health equity. So she brings a special perspective to this topic. Uh, she is, after all, a general internist. She knows uh, the front lines of medicine. She's a social epidemiologist and she's a health services researcher. She was one of the first scientists to document the disparities that happen in the quality of relationships between physicians and patients, oftentimes reflecting their social grouping or their racial ethnic status, and designed innovative interventions, didn't just observe the problem, but tried to figure out how could we intervene here uh, to target our communication skills, self-management skills, and the ability to address the needs of populations experiencing health disparities. She's the author of over 180 publications, has been the principal investigator on more than 15 federal and private foundation grants, and a devoted mentor uh, to more than 60 individuals seeking careers in medicine, nursing, and public health. Title of her uh, dire lecture today is Deep and Wide, as you can see on the screen, The Voyage to Discover Local and Global Health Equity. And indeed, a laudable goal and a very bold one. And we have the right person to hear about uh, things that are laudable and bold. So please join me virtually in welcoming uh, Professor Lisa Cooper of Johns Hopkins. Thank you very much. Thank you, Francis, for that uh, warm welcome. And thank you to the NIH for inviting me to give this very special lecture um, named in, in honor and in memory of, of Dr. Dyer. So um, I want to talk to you today about the stages of this voyage um, 
to achieve local and global health equity. And I will talk to you um, about it in the different stages that I've experienced. So defining the course, steering with purpose, choosing co-captains and companions, planning for turbulence and persevering through it and embracing destiny. So first, uh, where did this voyage begin? As Francis mentioned to you, I was born in Liberia, West Africa, a country founded in the early 1800 by freed slaves and free blacks who had left America and returned to Africa in search of freedom and a better life. And uh, the individuals in the middle of the slide are my parents, Dr. Henry N. Cooper and Mrs. Isetta R. Cooper. Um, my father was a surgeon and my mother uh, worked as a librarian at the University of Liberia. And they were both involved in uh, several civic organizations as well and provided a lot of support to our extended family. And so they taught my brother and sister and me, and that's us in the lower right corner there, uh, about the importance of using the, the gifts and talents that you have and the resources with which you have been blessed to improve the lives of others and to serve your community. So, you know, growing up in Liberia, I was very much aware of how good uh, my life was and my health, the, the quality of my life. And although I lived in a, in a spacious home that was very comfortable, and that's shown like on the left side of the slide here, and I went to a private international school, there were lots of children around me who uh, didn't have those same things. They um, basically lived in homes that had dirt floors and without running water or electricity. Many of them went to schools that didn't have the books or supplies that my school had. So many of them didn't have enough food to eat every day. And I was acutely aware of this even as a young child. And I always wondered what it would look like if we all had similar opportunities to live a good life. And I didn't know the terms back then, but what I was thinking about was social justice, you know, which is basically fairness in the distribution of wealth, opportunities and privileges within a society. And when we have social justice, that means our society does whatever it can to protect the least advantaged members of our society. So, the, for me, the first part of this voyage was from injustice to justice. And I, I referenced this quote by Dr. Martin Luther King uh, that he wrote in his letter from the Birmingham City Jail, actually the same year I was born, where he said that injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. And I feel like this has been one of the, you know, the inspirational um, mantras that I've had for my life. Um, in fact, Dr. King was arrested on the very day that I was born and put in uh, Birmingham jail without having access to uh, a lawyer because he had uh, participated in a political demonstration, which was basically uh, not anything that was wrong, but there was a law against it, which was not just. And so when he left uh, the Birmingham jail, that's when he penned this letter uh, back to the newspaper, which was basically saying, you know, that that this is how he felt, you know, because there were other people at the time who had written letters to uh, uh, the newspaper saying that they felt that these protests were unwise. Now, does any of this sound familiar to you all? So anyway, so that's where we were. And so the course for me is, is to achieve um, social justice is actually to go from where we are right now, which is health disparities. And so those children that I saw around me in Liberia were the faces of health disparities. They had um, differences in their health and their ability to, um, to achieve uh, optimal health and their burden of disease and injury they had or violence was based on things that were preventable. And um, they were socially disadvantaged because they didn't have the income and they, their parents didn't have the education um, and the access to resources that my parents had. So um, I began to understand during this time, um, actually as I progressed through my training, was that my purpose would be to advance health equity. And, and the idea that, that health equity is, has been defined by a number of different groups, but this definition comes from the World Health Organization, which says that health equity is when every person has the opportunity to attain his or her full health potential and no one is disadvantaged from achieving this potential because of social position or other socially determined circumstances. 
So this is the course that, um, that I wanted to chart for uh, this voyage. So after graduating from Emory College and from University of North Carolina School of Medicine, I did my residency at University of Maryland Hospital in Baltimore in the late 1980s and early 1990s. Now, many of you may remember that um, at that time, there was a huge um, epidemic, uh, opioid epidemic uh, related to heroin and um, HIV at the same time. And so a lot of the patients I saw in Baltimore um, were actually not that different from the people that I saw growing up in Liberia. Many of them didn't have the opportunities to be healthy uh, because they had financial struggles. There was inequity in their ability to obtain a good education or to get a good job. They were experienced neighborhood crime. And I saw communication problems between these patients and the doctors and nurses that were seeing them that often compromised diagnosis and treatment. Most of the patients that we saw were African-American and they were poor. And most of the health professionals were white and middle class or upper middle class. Now, several experiences that I had with patients during this time helped me to know that it was very important for me to deliver excellent care to all these patients, but that it was really going to be important for me to get involved even on a broader level in really shaping um, the way that we deliver care to these populations and the way that these communities experience health. So I decided to go to Johns Hopkins to do a fellowship in general internal medicine, which included training in clinical and public health research methods at the Bloomberg School of Public Health. I wanted to do this because I knew that in order to address these problems that we really needed to basically understand them more. And when I looked at the literature, I didn't see that there, was, there were as many scientists working on these questions as I saw working on many other issues. So I knew that it would be important for me to do this and I felt like my life experiences made me fairly well prepared to ask the right questions and to, uh, to try to learn more about the best way to answer them. So if I just look you know, uh, around me in Baltimore where I work currently, uh, I, I work at Johns Hopkins Hospital. I also work at a community health center which is not far away. Um, in the Madison East End neighborhood. If I just look at two neighborhoods in Baltimore, many of you have probably seen similar slides to this for Washington DC or other cities. I see that there's a 20 year gap in life expectancy between Roland Park where uh, many Johns Hopkins faculty live and Madison East End where uh, Johns Hopkins Hospital is and where I see patients. And so, you know, the death rate from heart disease uh, in Madison East End is two and a half times higher um, the average household income is uh, about 30% uh, of what it is in, in Roland Park. And if you look at the population makeup, you can see that Roland Park is about 80% white, whereas Madison East End is about 90% black. So you're beginning to get a sense of the fact that, you know, health is, is shaped a lot by uh, where people live and uh, their life experiences before they even uh, get into the healthcare center. And so, you know, so we all know, we've heard a lot about this recently, health disparities are widespread and their effects on mortality and on quality of life and costs are actually impacting us all. And sadly, national data shows that we've had very limited progress on health equity in the US over the past 25 to 30 years even though we have had improvements in overall health of the population. So whether we look at disparities according to race or income, we see that we've made relatively little progress during this time. The other thing we see is that COVID-19 has actually shown a light on these existing health disparities and magnified them. So how do we address these disparities? We really have to learn about the ways they originate and the complex interactions upon, uh, among multiple factors that affect people in different social groups differently, all the way from individual behaviors to institutional and economic policies that perpetuate the broader structural factors. Now, what are these broader structural factors? They are the isms, a lot of the isms, racism, sexism, classism, ableism. These are the factors that shape a lot of the complex interactions and exposures to these different factors for people in different groups. 
we know that these isms, in particular, we know racism actually initiates and, and perpetuates racial prejudice and negative stereotypes about people. Um, it lessens the support for egalitarian policies. Um, it actually also allows people to engage in uh, interpersonal behaviors that perpetuate discrimination. It changes the way resources are delivered by institutions and how they are allocated in our society. So these resources include things like education, employment, housing, and medical care, and of course, um, you know, criminal justice. So we know that a lot of these interactions trigger very damaging psychological responses from individuals in these groups that uh, contribute to, you know, negative behavioral responses, things like risk behaviors, as well as biological um, responses. And these are the things that have led to things like premature aging um, on an individual level in people from marginalized groups. So we know that there are many causes of health disparities, but we really have to look at the root causes if we really want to make a difference in that. Now, through this voyage, it, it helps because health disparities are so complex is to steer this voyage with purpose. So, you know, for me as a young person, um, a young scientist, I knew it wouldn't be possible for me to possibly tackle all of these things at one time. So one series of factors that really intrigued me was the role of the healthcare system and the role of, of social relationships in perpetuating health disparities. In healthcare in particular, we know that relationships provide the context for so many things. How do we get a diagnosis? How do we exchange information? How do we decide who gets what treatment? How do we assess whether the, the, the outcome of treatment is successful? A lot of that is done through relationships between doctors and patients, um, between other health professionals and patients, among health professionals, and among uh, administrators and other people within the health system. So I was really uh, intrigued in how about how those relationships actually work um, and uh, how they sort of um, provide the context for a lot of things that go on within healthcare. The, the relationship that intrigued me the most was the doctor-patient relationship naturally because I'm a physician. And so I started out there and as Dr. Collins mentioned, um, my colleagues and I did a series of studies where we examined the relationship between doctors and uh, patients of color, African-Americans and Hispanics, and we looked at how, how these patients experienced their care versus white patients, and we found that they experienced lower levels of participation in decisions, they, um, they had less trust in their physicians, and when we actually audio recorded their visits, we found that uh, patients of color actually spoke less, doctors tended to dominate the conversation more and sound less friendly, they actually engaged in less rapport building. So they didn't show as much empathy, uh, at least speak about it. And they didn't talk as much about psychosocial issues. So things like family and work and things outside of, of medical care, they, they kind of stuck to the medical agenda. We also found that when doctors and patients belong to the same race though, that the visits were longer and patients sounded happier and more relaxed and there was more participatory decision-making and satisfaction. So that was really, some, those were some controversial findings at the time, uh, not sort of surprising, I don't think, but I think because doctors and nurses, we all as health professionals don't go into medicine thinking we're gonna treat people differently. So I think people were a little bit taken aback by this. So we wanted to understand more about why this was happening. And we didn't, we knew it wasn't intentional because a lot of health professionals said that they really had positive feelings of for people of, of all different groups, social groups, racial groups. So we did a study to look at implicit racial bias because we thought perhaps uh, there's bias going on that people don't even know about and we could maybe um, intervene in that way. And there, at that time, their social psychologists have been doing lots of studies of implicit racial bias, showing that it was actually quite common in the general population. So we wanted to study it among physicians. So we did a study in, in the Baltimore, Washington area where we examined uh, 40 primary care physicians and almost uh, 270 of their patients. We gave them the implicit race bias uh, test. We also gave them another um, implicit test, association test that is specifically uh, a medically focused one around uh, uh, medical compliance. And we asked 
we basically then asked if we could record the visits of these patients. And we asked patients and doctors and got their permission. So we recorded those visits and we looked to see whether there was a relationship between the level of implicit racial bias and the type of communication. And we found that two thirds of physicians actually had implicit racial bias favoring whites over blacks. And that when they, when they did have implicit racial bias that they tended to communicate more poorly with their African-American patients and their African-American patients also rated them more poorly in terms of being less trustworthy, less respectful, and um, less likely to engage them in decisions. So this was really concerning. And again, but it did was starting to get to the root of some of why we were seeing these differences in patterns of care. And um, potentially, even though we know there, there were a lot of broader societal factors, this was giving uh, us a window into what's going on within the healthcare system. So, you know, I, I went on after that, um, as Dr. Collins mentioned, to study other aspects of, of individuals that, that, that might impact the relationship. So things that were visible above the waterline, and this is a metaphor for um, a, a cultural iceberg metaphor, which basically um, gets at the idea that, you know, relationships are shaped by things that are visible and invisible. So there are many things that are below the surface that if we're not aware of and we don't steer carefully, that it can be very dangerous. And so that I think that's what we've seen is that, you know, there are lots of issues going on below the surface in relationships. And the more different people are from one another, it, the more important it is for us to basically understand and uncover those issues and see if uh, we can address them so that we don't run into trouble. So we did a series of other studies looking at different attitudes uh, that are below the surface, looking at different ways of, of classifying concordance between people. And then we went on to develop interventions that actually um, promoted things like better communication, uh, more respect and trust, um, and concordance, um, concordance in values. So we did things like that using uh, targeting physicians and patients. And we did show some progress but again, these were limited um, in scope. The studies had on average, you know, 300, 200 patients. And we saw that, you know, overall, we weren't making that much impact in what was going on on a national level. And so, you know, the field had, has begun to evolve. And so over time, it became clear that we weren't gonna be able to just target individual patients or individual physicians if we really wanna impact health equity, that we really need to go deep, you know, that we need to target interventions at multiple levels. So this is an ecological model that shows all the different levels of influence on health and health equity and all the different potential intervention targets that could be used, for example, if we wanted to impact healthcare processes as a way of, of improving uh, equitable outcomes. And so we began to use more of this ecological approach where our interventions um, would be, move beyond just working with individual patients and physicians, and then begin looking more at sort of organizational factors to be to look at sort of the patient's social context, um, what's going on in their family, what's going on in their workplace, what other forms of social support uh, do they have uh, when they're not in the doctor's office, and then also working on a community level with policymakers, decision makers, other people who are active um, activists within communities that have influenced on how resources are distributed and how capacity is built. So that's where we, we began to move, I would say, you know, about 20 years ago, uh, 15 to 20 years ago into this sort of multiple, um, multi-level intervention approach. The other thing we learned is that, you know, we had a lot of knowledge um, that, but there was such, there was a gap between what we knew and what we were doing in terms of making progress. And so a lot of this had to do with the fact that we weren't actually implementing what we knew to be effective. Um, we didn't, because in large part, we actually didn't know how to implement those things. We didn't understand a lot about, you know, what the barriers might be to implementing um, the things that are evidence-based. So it's not to say that we don't need more knowledge. This is on the left-hand side of the slide. We continue to need more knowledge about the efficacy and effectiveness of clinical and, and basic biomedical, you know, uh, treatments and things like that. We still need epidemiology about different groups. For example, we know quite a bit about African-Americans, but maybe not as much about 
different uh, Hispanic populations, different American Indian populations, or different uh, Asian American or other immigrant groups. So there's still a need for more knowledge, but we do have a lot of knowledge in health equity research, and we do, but we have a big gap between um, what we know and what we're actually doing to achieve equity. So because this gap is an implementation gap, we really uh, have come to understand that we need to use transdisciplinary research and stakeholder engagement um, basically to, to, to begin to successfully translate um, these effective uh, programs into practice and policy. So how do we do that? One way to do that is through implementation science. And many of you may have heard this term. Um, uh, it's an area of a science uh, area of science that's growing and growing in its support at NIH, I'm glad to say, is the study of methods to promote integration of research findings and evidence into healthcare practice and policy. And so, you know, one thing it does is that it seeks to understand, um, like, the behavior of health professionals or other stakeholders, and to understand how those variables act to either sustain or prevent uh, the uptake and the adoption and the implementation of evidence-based programs. It also tries to investigate whatever barriers or bottlenecks there might be. It tries to test new ways of, of improving um, health programming and also looks to see if whether there's a causal relationship between an intervention that we implement and its actual impact. So we've begun to use more implementation science methods. The other thing, that has really grown in health equity research is this community-based participatory research strategy. That has been around for many years, but just wasn't being used broadly across the scientific enterprise. And it's been described by the Kellogg Foundation Community Health Scholars Program as a collaborative approach to research that equitably involves all partners in the research process and recognizes the unique strengths that each brings. So, you know, Here's the issue. We're going to study communities that have been impacted by health equity or health inequities, and we're not going to involve people from those communities in um, deciding what questions need to be asked or how we need to study the problem or, you know, where we need to intervene or how we need to interpret our results. That doesn't make any sense. And so, you know, CBPR is actually, you know, not only grounded in um, wonderful like sort of ethical principles but there's actually a, a growing literature that shows that it does have a positive effect in terms of um, not only its in engagement with communities and building of trust but also a success in um, adaptation of programs into uh, into communities so the idea is to, tr to to use this not only to conduct research but also to transform it um, into something where communities can become more engaged and empowered and actually bring about positive social change. So those are the, the strategies we're using. And about 10 years ago, I was fortunate to be funded by NIH um, to, to establish a Center for Population Health and Health Disparities at Johns Hopkins focused on cardiovascular health disparities. And we conducted three multi-level intervention trials at that time addressing hypertension. We brought together a diverse team of physicians, nurses, pharmacists, uh, epidemiologists, biostatisticians. We have uh, organizational researchers, economists. And uh, fortunately, we're able to conduct a series of studies using different strategies, one of them more a health system based, which was Project Redchip. Um, on changing the, the organizational practices and the structures for delivery of uh, care management to patients with hypertension, five plus nuts and beans, more focused on not only um, individual counseling for um, patients, but also provision of a food allowance, so an income supplement to um, enhance uh, dietary behaviors as a way of reducing um, hypertension, uncontrolled hypertension in individuals who were at high risk and who lived in a food desert. And then the ACT study, which was a study which used community health workers, a strategy, again, that had been documented in many ways to be an effective uh, strategy for patients with cardiovascular disease uh, who come from underserved communities, but had not been um, widely um, uh, um, adopted. And so we were able to show some, some very good findings there. Our health system program showed that care management was a cost-effective 
strategy for improving blood pressure control in African Americans and people over age 60. Um, our, our food um, dietary coaching and, and food allowance and delivery program, because we, we had the food was actually delivered uh, from an online grocery store to the public library to also enhance access, that that improved the dietary behaviors of patients living in the food desert. And then the ACT study showed improvements in blood pressure across three different programs, but the community health worker program actually all by itself seemed to be quite effective and we didn't even need to add anything more, you know, like an individualized problem solving training or anything else. So the next um, thing I wanna say is that after uh, the first five years of the funding of that center, um, we knew that it was important for us to continue this work and that we wanted to broaden it beyond just cardiovascular disease because we had increasing interest across our university in using this, these approaches across multiple conditions and multiple populations. So we changed the name of the center to the Center for Health Equity as opposed to the Center to Eliminate Cardiovascular Health Disparities 10 years. Um, and now we've been in existence 10 years, but we changed the name about five years ago and our mission is to promote equity in health for socially at risk populations through advancing scientific knowledge, educating and training leaders and partnering with communities. And so uh, you can see this is our community advisory board uh, where, and this was our holiday greeting that we sent out in January of 2020. And you know, the other important point to make here on this voyage is that you need, you need co-captains and companions to help you get through. So these are some of my co-captains and companions who are the associate directors, uh, our community advisory board chair, and our key staff members who make uh, this work possible because it's, again, it's not uh, something that can be done alone. And we found that actually organizing ourselves in this way helps us to be uh, much more um, effective and uh, able to be responsive to, to key stakeholders, whether they be community members, health system, stakeholders, other researchers, or people seeking uh, training. So what we do, we have this three-pronged approach, which I mentioned to you is research and uh, community engagement and training. And our engagement strategy involves a community advisory board, our health system partners, as well as local, national, and global policymakers. We have currently three active research projects, uh, one of which I will go, two of which I will describe a little bit more in detail. Uh, one of them, uh, the Rich Life Project. Uh, we have the Five Plus Nuts and Beans for Kidneys, which is uh, an adaptation of our earlier trial uh, for people who have early kidney disease, uh, recognizing that those people are at particularly high risk for, uh, for worsening kidney disease when their blood pressure is uncontrolled and that dietary factors are very important to address. Uh, and then the ADINCRA study, which we are doing now in Ghana. And then in our training, we have a number of courses that are at Johns Hopkins, including uh, in the School of Public Health, as well as our monthly seminar series called our JAM sessions. And we have opportunities for individualized training of uh, people all the way from undergraduates uh, to uh, junior faculty. Our community advisory board is critical to our work. Um, the mission is to promote health equity in communities locally and globally through strong community academic partnerships. We have diverse stakeholders that, that include more than 60 organizations and individuals. And we've had a very active group uh, for the past 10 years because we've really uh, formed this group using relationship-centered principles. You know, we, we focus a lot on uh, clear communication on trustworthiness, uh, doing what we say we're going to do, uh, on being inclusive, listening respectfully, respecting diverse uh, opinions and perspectives. And so this is really critically important for creating the pathways uh, for us to learn from one another, uh, to develop more uh, partnerships in all phases of our research and practice, assuring that the research is relevant, both from a cultural and a structural standpoint, and then that we disseminate and translate our research findings um, appropriately. So these are just a sampling of some of our health system and community partners. A lot of our health system partners are federally qualified community health centers because those organizations are the ones that provide a lot of care to the underserved populations that we want to, uh, who we want to help. 
Um, and our community partners range from national organizations, um, provider and uh, patient organizations, all the way to local um, leaders who are focused on um, addressing particular issues within the Baltimore community. And so um, we couldn't do any of this work without them. And um, we continue to grow and, and, and to you know, seek, uh, again, more representation from those individuals, as well as from policymakers within public health and within um, the, at the local city level and state levels of government. So um, right now, I'm just going to tell you a little bit about our current uh, work. Our Rich Life Project is, a, is funded by NHLBI, and PCORI is a cluster randomized trial, a hybrid effectiveness implementation trial that includes 30 practices in Maryland and Pennsylvania. We've enrolled 1,822 patients already, um, so proud of that, that we reached 96% uh, of our goal. And these individuals have uncontrolled hypertension plus at least one other condition. And we're comparing a standard of care plus, which is an intervention that focuses more mostly on the health system and its leaders and on improving uh, basic uh, best practices for hypertension management um, to an intervention that includes all of those system level uh, efforts, but also includes a nurse care manager who delivers individualized care to these patients who are in the intervention and can step the care, make it more intensive if the patient has more needs. Now, if they have more social needs, they get uh, a community health worker added to their care team. And if they have more specialized medical needs, they um, have the opportunity to have their case presented to a specialist core, which is a, a virtual group of specialists who can provide expertise and advice to the primary care team. Now, our main outcomes are blood pressure control and change in patient activation at 12 months primarily and then 24 months secondarily. And in addition to doing our work in Baltimore, what we've done uh, in recent years, based on um, my own personal background and interest in sort of advancing knowledge um, and learning uh, from between high and low income countries uh, and my own personal experience in in Africa, we developed a program called our local and global, um, local to global, global to local initiative. And so through that program, we're doing a lot of um, bi-directional learning. It's a, it's a learning collaborative between researchers and practitioners. And um, we are learning uh, from each other and, and building more collaborations to work with one another to apply learnings from, from one setting to another. And so one example of our uh, local global uh, initiative is our study called the Adinkra study, which is a, a trial based in Ghana, a two arm cluster randomized trial in six community based clinics in Kumasi, Ghana. And we've successfully enrolled our 240 patients with uncontrolled hypertension, half of whom are also socioeconomically deprived. Comparing uh, an enhanced usual care intervention, which is basically lifestyle text messages for patients to a multi-level program that includes community health nurses working with primary care physicians. There's a, a very much a shortage of primary care physicians there. So needing to do a lot of task shifting to community health nurses who can provide individualized care to patients and also coupled that with home blood pressure monitoring and M health technology to help uh, overcome sort of the geographic barriers to care um, and also the shortage of, of healthcare personnel. And interestingly enough, technology is widely available there. And so um, there we are able to, to really apply that and, and apply some learnings from there that we can use in Baltimore. So again, our main outcomes are similar to the ones we have in uh, the Rich Life Project, but we also will be looking at acceptability and use, usability of the app which is called a coma pa. And um, so that is a, a Ghanaian um, um, language. It's basically uh, the, the program has been adapted for the Ghanaian context um, with culturally appropriate uh, messaging around health behaviors, including diet and physical activity, as well as medication adherence. And it's a partnership between Johns Hopkins and the Kwame Nkrumah University of Science and Technology. So uh, without saying much more, this, these are two massive open online courses that our center has developed um, that now uh, extends our reach 
to almost 2,000 learners actually around the world. Um, um, we have two courses, a basic foundations course, one that is a little bit more advanced, um, on, focused on researchers. And then we have plans to, uh, to create two more, uh, probably within the upcoming year, one on local global learning and another one on um, addressing structural racism in healthcare to advance health equity. So just in summary, you know, one of the things we've learned about reducing racial inequities in health is that we do already have a lot that we know that we can use to take action. And so my colleague, Dr. David Williams and I described these three broad strategies in, in a review article that we wrote last year, where we sort of grouped the strategies into three things, creating communities of opportunity. And this is really focusing more on the social determinants of health, making sure we do create communities that focus on early childhood development, uh, policies to reduce childhood poverty, uh, increasing the minimum wage or providing income support for adults and ensuring healthy housing and neighborhood conditions. And those aren't things that I've worked on personally, but I have a lot of colleagues who work uh, on those areas. The area where I've done a lot of my work has been on building more health into the delivery of healthcare, which you just heard about. Um, and then finally, the broader sort of research agenda we said is that we really need to raise more awareness uh, societally about the impact of inequities and build political will to address that. And as many of you know, that is a lot of what we are dealing with right at this moment. I think it's really in getting um, our society to, to, to basically appreciate that inequities in health are about more than individual choices, that they are a lot about these other factors that we as a society have made decisions about how we allocate our resources and that impact people's ability to be healthy. So here we are in 2020 and we encountered turbulence through the COVID-19 pandemic. I'm trying to take a look at my time here to see how I'm doing. Um, this shouldn't take much longer. So in every journey there's turbulence and um, our, our journey uh, has hit major turbulence this year. Little did we know, Dr. Williams and I, when we wrote that review article, was that right around the corner was going to be one of the largest, greatest challenges to health uh, of our, our global challenges to, to health in, in over 100 years. So you all can see that from today, this is the Johns Hopkins COVID uh, dashboard showing that uh, we're up to 44 million global cases of COVID-19 1.1, almost 1.2 million deaths, I mean 1.17, sorry, million deaths. And in the United States, 227,000 deaths. So obviously uh, we are in the midst of this turbulent uh, storm as we speak. Um, the other thing we've seen, this is CDC data, is that our disparity populations have been particularly hard hit with much higher case and hospitalization rates and this slide actually shows the death rates to be modestly higher, but actually, if you look at um, data that's age adjusted, you will see that African Americans, Latinos, and indigenous uh, people have death rates that are about three times higher that of whites from COVID-19. And people who are Pacific Islander have death rates that are about 2.4 times that of whites. So, um, you know, Asian Americans and whites being um, more similar in their experiences. So it's important for us to look at the age adjusted uh, data to see what we're actually dealing with. And this pandemic has really shown a, a magnifying glass on the issue of inequities in health. So I don't think it surprises anyone to know why um, the, you know, we have these challenges that, that uh, disparity populations experience on a daily basis that have now been magnified, you know, lacks of access to basic resources suboptimal housing conditions, more likely to be employed in essential jobs that have limited protections, things like lack of PPE, lack of uh, access to health care or insurance, uh, lack of paid sick leave, and then less access to health care services, combined with uh, an understandable mistrust of institutions due to past history of discriminatory experiences. So we have this perfect you know, storm right now. Uh, and compounded with that is the, the whole issue of uh, violence against um, African Americans and other people of color by police leading to um, the racial uh, tensions and, and protests. So we have these challenges that are magnified at this time. What are we doing at the Center for Health Equity? We are doing some ancillary studies 
uh, also trying to address some of these barriers among our study participants um, by asking about their needs and trying to help to address them. But we're studying uh, a number of things like their exposure, their experiences with care, and some of the consequences of the pandemic on individuals in our study, as well as in their, in their families and social networks. We're also studying um, health frontline healthcare workers um, and how to support them in the face and aftermath of COVID-19. And uh, my colleague, Dr. Josh Starstein and I actually outlined a five point game plan to help to address the most vulnerable during this time. Um, and so we did this in uh, Politico, we wrote an op-ed. And so I'll just tell you about these five uh, areas and what the center is doing uh, sort of quickly. So first we recommended tracking data on COVID-19 cases by race, ethnicity and geography. And we really stress the importance that local and national leaders need this information to know who is at risk, what factors are contributing to the increased spread and where should they allocate their resources. So you can see from this slide that we've done a number of different engagements with mayors uh, through the Bloomberg Harvard City Leadership Initiative with local and uh, national leaders through um, closed session hearings and briefings with the US congressmen and Senate um, speaking with the media as well, uh, speaking, uh, making sure that we really called for uh, data to be uh, provided. And we've seen that that has come about. Um, we called for communication and building trust with communities of color. How do we do that? We use trusted agents. We work with our community partners. We don't um, lecture people. We, we, we go and we listen to what their concerns are. We make sure that when we send messages out that they are um, delivered in a way and by people that will be more likely to deliver the message in a way that it can be received. So we've done a number of different podcasts, radio interviews. Uh, we contributed to the State of Black America uh, report by the National Urban League. We've interacted with the Black Enterprise Magazine, with uh, the Essence Magazine Wellhouse, number of different ways to uh, held phone calls with the Baltimore City um, mayor and city council where we take questions from local citizens. And so I think this is very, very important um, strategy. Also um, take questions from the, from, you know, uh, local church leaders, um, local leaders, and actually engage them in delivering the messages around how to, how people can stay safe, how they can protect themselves. And then now with the COVID vaccine being tested, um, helping to basically dispel myths, but also to engender more um, conversation and hopefully um, prove scientists to be more trustworthy to these communities. Um, we, we have advocated for enhancing access to testing in healthcare, you know, for example, by uh, working with health systems to set up testing centers within communities, things like mobile units. Um, uh, also um, pushed for, uh, Medi Medicaid expansion uh, to be, uh, and Medicaid enrollment to be, um, the time for that to be expanded, um, really calling for um, preservation of the Affordable Care Act uh, as much as possible. Um, so we've done a lot of that. Pro calling for protection of essential and low wage workers. It's really important for us to protect our frontline workers make sure they have adequate testing uh, and medical supplies and that they, their working conditions are safe, um, may, making sure that some of the congressional funds that are provided go to employers who can then extend those benefits to these frontline workers who will need um, increased wages, hazard pay, uh, sick time to be covered, all those kinds of things. And then finally, providing social services to keep vulnerable groups uh, safe. One of the things I was involved in recently was writing a letter to Governor Hogan of Maryland to uh, ex extend the moratorium on evictions. People don't need to become homeless at a time like this. Um, uh, working with schools around how they can provide um, laptops to students who are from low income communities who don't have that. Making sure we uh, look out for the homeless in our communities, making sure we get involved with anchor institution strategies to and community partnerships to deliver food and necessary supplies to people who are in need. So this is all very critical at this time. And it just sort of things go full circle, you know, so, you know, I recently wrote um, an op-ed an editorial actually in JAMA um, around um, COVID and health equity. And basically 
called for um, a new kind of herd immunity. You know, we tend to focus on, on the medical pieces, which are important, um, getting a vaccine, getting the treatments right for COVID. But bottom line is that a lot of what we're seeing in the spread of COVID and in its impact on um, uh, people who are uh, poor or people who are people of color is because we don't have systematic comprehensive investments in addressing social determinants of health. So we wanna flatten that curve long-term. We need to do that. We need to focus on protecting the most vulnerable, not only because we, we ought to do it because it's a nice thing to do, but it also de decreases the spread of infection. And so the resistance to the spread of poor health in our society will only occur when we have a sufficient number of people across all groups who are protected from and therefore immune to these negative social factors. So that is when we're gonna be able to really embrace our destiny, which is health equity, uh, when every person has the opportunity to attain his or her full health potential. Uh, and so this is just my summary slide of the five steps of, um, in the voyage. Um, together, we're stronger and healthier and better equipped if we can stay on course on this journey with our co-captains and companions and persevering through the turbulence. And so this is an African proverb that I'll close with uh, that says, if you wanna go far alone, go, when you wanna go far, go alone. If you wanna go, if you wanna go fast, go alone, I'm sorry. And if you wanna go far, go together. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Cooper. You really um, did a, it was a tour de force, um, particularly starting from your origins and bringing everything full circle. Uh, really greatly appreciate that. Um, and we have a few minutes uh, for some questions. Um, I will remind everyone that you can uh, submit questions in um, the uh, video cast. Um, I know that we have, uh, at least three that are here. And the first one is my question. <laughs> um, you uh, talk very, you've been very successful. You talk very positively about community-based participatory research, uh, but there are some who have not been as successful uh, focusing on that uh, means of conducting research. And the question I have is what your thoughts are about that. Why is it that uh, there is sometimes less success uh, in uh, using that as a means of proposal for grant uh, submissions, uh, its implementation, that sort of thing. Yeah. So, are, so are you asking about being successful in terms of getting grant funding or in terms of pillar? Okay. Well, you know, so I think that some of it has to do with um, education of the scientific uh, community more about what, what community-based participatory research is and what its value is. So I think honestly, we have to do a better job of educating our entire uh, scientific community about it. Um, I think that also as people who do that work also probably could benefit from understanding more about how to communicate about it in a way that other scientists understand what it is. Um, also uh, being more clear about what the methods are um, and um, what the sort of measures are of impact and how you plan to study it. Uh, a lot of times we don't talk about studying the actual impact of CBPR. We just talk about CBPR as something that we're doing in the background. But I think that there is a whole science to CBPR itself and um, how it's done and um, how it works and why it's effective. And I think that there should be more scholarship that we devote uh, in, in that area as well. And, and actually we are um, hoping to contribute to that in many ways. What we are doing right now is doing an evaluation of our partnership and looking at the social networks that have been formed over time and how they've been used to build capacity for different members and what they have, what this partnership has actually led to. I think that's a, that also is going to help quite a bit. But I do think that it's a long-term commitment and um, I think it's not easy, but I think we do have to educate our colleagues and, uh, and you know, help them to understand what the value is of this approach. Thank you. Um, we have several questions here. Um, 
what can NIH do to communicate with communities of color about COVID-19? For example, explaining what clinical trials are, the difference between COVID-19 uh, tests, or what is in the candidate vaccines. What are some initial thoughts that you might have in response to that? So, you know, I'm, I'm actually really proud that NIH has established, um, you know, an initiative called SEAL. Um, the, it's a community engagement to um, alliance uh, against COVID-19. And that program is, has funded uh, investigators and community partners across 11 states right now. And they are working very hard on uh, different areas, you know, one of them being communication. So um, what are some of the best communication strategies that uh, can be applied in this situation? Um, one of them is around inclusive participation. How do we make sure that people who are from diverse groups who are, have not traditionally been included in research are actually reached for this? You know, and then another one is around assessment and measurement, making sure we're using the right uh, tools. So I think NIH is doing that as partnered with uh, national organizations, um, national organizations from historically black, historically Hispanic communities, um, also uh, uh, churches, for example, um, and then really working with these local teams, working, uh, making sure that there's a coordinated approach that, uh, that we develop uh, toolkits that people can use and that we actually uh, measure you know, the impact of the different efforts that we're using to determine which ones are most effective. So I think we've, we've gotten to a good, off to a good start really trying to centralize that information and make sure that it gets communicated clearly, but clearly it's a big job. Thank you for the shout out. Mm -hmm. um, can you share an example of bi-directional lessons learned from your global to local learning collaborative? What have you learned from other countries that influenced your work? So I guess um, I know one of the things that I think about is that um, in the, the use of like mobile phone technology, for example, you know, I actually didn't really think about how useful that might be in East Baltimore, you know, because I know that uh, we have this bias that a lot of older individuals, for example, have such a hard time using mobile technology and people who don't have as much um, literacy with using that equipment. But we found that people who have relatively low levels of education um, in Africa were quite capable of using um, an app to monitor and report their symptoms, to record their, their home blood pressure monitors, and to be in touch with their community health nurses. So it really gave me more um, confidence about the fact that something very similar could work in, in East Baltimore, where people might actually have challenges with transportation, getting to uh, the doctor back and forth, and um, you know, that they actually might not have such a hard time using um, that technology, especially if it involves communication with someone who's very available to them, like a community health worker. Great. Um, can you comment on the relative contribution of pre-existing conditions versus differential virus exposure to COVID uh, deaths and racial and ethnic disparities? So, you know, I mean, I think we know that, that we have uh, overrepresentation of people of color among frontline workers and you know a lot of conditions that make it difficult for people to protect themselves from exposure so whether they live in crowded homes or have to take public transportation um, we know that that contributes to a certain extent uh, to the number of cases um, you know where we're seeing sort of the higher um, hospitalizations and mortality rates that also suggest that even above and beyond the exposure that there's that you know the comorbid conditions that are increasing the risk of a poor outcome based on in infection you know so I think all of those things are important um, they are probably contributing I, I, I can't tell you quantitatively how much but I do know that that there are similar sort of root causes of all of those things. So the fact that people have more chronic conditions is because they, they live in neighborhoods where they haven't had access to healthy food and, you know, where they, and they've been exposed to more stress from, you know, not having financial opportunities. So I think they have common root causes. And so, um, you know, I think it's important to know how much each is contributing, but the bottom line is it's all connected and all related and we, we need to work on all of it. 
Um, I know that we are at the time limit. I'm going to squeeze in one more question. Um, what do you think is the best way to integrate cultural preferences into health recommendations in terms of balancing implementation and avoiding um, uh, challenges in terms of uh, cultural imperialism? For example, the DASH diet is not culturally acceptable in many places. I know that's a quick yeah. response. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, I think that the DASH diet, I, I know for a fact that it's been worked on so that if we can identify things that are sort of replacements for the traditional examples that we might give, things that might be more culturally appropriate or that might fit, um, that it's, I know it has been done. And I think a lot of it is just uh, being patient and and listening and being creative. Um, I don't think it's impossible, but I think it's not a quick answer. And so I think that's where the challenge comes in. But I know that that has been done. So I think, again, a lot of it is it goes back to the sort of um, community-based participatory approach and the relationship-centered um, approach. OK. Well, Dr. Cooper, thank you so very much. This has been wonderful. Uh, it's, it's so inspiring what you're doing and the way that you came to doing all of these things. And on behalf of all of us, thank you. Thank you for having me.